Welcome to the Plugs Podcast. This is Marshall, your host, and I have the co-host, Evan, with me. How's it going? It's a great night. And tonight, we're working with a man named Tiger. For the past 20 years or so, he's been out on the streets, helping the unfortunate, doing his best to show his love, crawling into the bushes and serving food. And uh, he has so many stories for us. This guy's been to heaven twice in his life. Welcome, Tiger. I thought I'd, uh, thought I'd read something. It's not... Um... Well, you can, you can, y'all can be the judge on where it's coming from. All right. All right. I'll read this. Okay. It's uh, actually called, um, it's titled uh, Hymn Number Two, Formerly 24. And then I'm going to read uh, Hymn Number Three and Five. All right, here we go. Uh, I give thee thanks. Because of the spirits, no, notice I had to put on the double glasses. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting old, man. I'm getting old. Yeah, I'm getting old. Plus, the lighting out here is not great. I give thee thanks because of the spirits which thou hast given to me. Personally, I don't like all the these and thous, but I'm just going to read it verbatim. I will bring forth the reply of the tongue to recount thy righteous deeds and the forbearance and the works of thy mighty right hand, and the pardon of the sin of the forefathers. I will bow down and employ thy mercy on my sins and wicked deeds, and on the perversity of my heart. For I have wallowed in uncleanliness, and have turned aside from the counsel of thy truth, and I have not labored for thine. Thine is righteousness, and an everlasting blessing be upon thy name. According to thy righteousness, let thy servant be redeemed, and the wicked be brought to an end. For I have understood, now, can I stop there? Sure. Let the wicked be brought to an end. Mm-hmm. What, what does that mean to you guys, let the wicked be brought to an end? Well, it's the last day for the wicked. Mm-hmm. Let it be done. Who are the wicked? The ones that are not loving. And right, I'm going to keep reading. For I have understood that it is thou who doth establish the path of whomsoever thou choosest. Thou dost hedge him in with true discernment, that he may not sin against thee, and that his humility may bear fruit through thy chastisement, that he may not sin against thee. Um, I don't know who that would be. I, I've, I've sinned. Have you sinned? That's right. Have you? I've sinned. It's got to be somebody that never sinned. Thou dost purify his heart in thy trials. Preserve thy servant, O God, lest he sin against thee, or stagger aside from any word of thy will. Strengthen the loins of thy servant, that he may resist the spirits of falsehood, that he may walk in all that thou lovest, and despise all that thou hatest. Now this is where I really wanted to get here. All these things thou dost establish in thy wisdom. Thou dost appoint all thy works before ever creating them, the host of thy spirits and the congregation of the holy ones, the heavens and all their hosts, and the earth and all things bring forth. Now we're going to really skip ahead. But what is the spirit of flesh, that it should understand all this, and that it should should comprehend? the great design of thy wisdom. What is he that is born of woman in the midst of all thy terrible works? He is but an edifice of dust, a thing kneaded with water, whose beginning is sinful iniquity and shameful nakedness and a font of uncleanliness and over whom a spirit of straying rules. That's us, boys. That's us. That's mankind. You know, you're out there thinking that, you know, you're, you're just so bad, you know. That you're just so bad, you, God wouldn't even have anything to do with you if you wanted to have something to do with him. 
because you're just so bad. Spirit of straying is just that in part. It's that that tug of war. That straying, man. Every single day. The flesh day. ever warreth with the spirit. Wow. There was a time uh, when I worked at the post office. There was a guy. Uh, actually, we hated each other for a long time. Uh, but uh, Christ has a way of reconciliation. And he was handing out little scriptures that he would have printed up and then cut them up in little pieces of paper and hand them out on break time at the post office. There'd be several hundred people going to break at a time and give, you know, several hundred people the word. And I started helping him out. And uh, somebody came to me one day and said, uh, you know, you're, you're offending some people with that. And I told him, uh, first of all, it's not my words. And secondly, Jesus said he's the one that, causes men offense but uh, uh, handing out those scriptures I had done something one day that was a sin and I was really shameful of it I was really regretful of it and um, I went to the to the sky that that the Lord used to actually introduce me and um, and I told him I'm not uh, I told him Dwayne I'm not uh, I'm not worthy to hand out this scripture man he looked at me and he said, none of us are, Bill, but he's worthy. He's worthy of it being handed out. It's his words. None of us will ever be worthy. When it talks in here in the, uh, I'm reading, I was reading from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And when it talks in here about the wicked, it's talking about Azazel. And his crew that God kicked out of heaven. It's not talking about people. For we are all evil. None of us are good. Not one, Jesus said. That's some of the problem today in the church. They want to want to put some people on pedestals. And they're just as wicked as you and I. Yep. There's only one good and like Marshall referred, I've seen him twice. Once alive and once dead. And um, that's, the, uh, that's the reason that I, as I read the word daily. That's the reason I do what I do, whatever I do. Um, it's love. It's not because I have to. He doesn't... Uh, he doesn't require anything from us. He did it all on the cross. But if uh, if you really love someone, you know, I, there's many a times I didn't want to go out on that street. I wanted to quit going, and um, and he would say to me, "You want to, so you want to quit coming and see me." Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You want to quit coming to see me? Because that's who I was going to see down there on the street, was him. Yeah, I think uh, what you just said a second ago about putting these people on pedestals, that's a dangerous place to be when you forget that you're a sinner because you completely abolish and disregard everything Christ did for your life when he died. When you have that facade, that persona of perfection, you're practically preaching that you don't need Christ. You're like the... Uh, you're like the Pharisees. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We're all filthy rags. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that just shows you. you know? Our righteousness. Okay, let's let's get that scripture right. Mm -hmm. What we do right is filthy rags. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our righteousness is filthy rags. The flesh is incapable of doing anything good, Paul said. Without his spirit, which we all have, or we be dead. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why it's important, I think, to read the word and be in the word as much as you can because you've got to put that fleshly dog at bay every single day so it doesn't become the primary dog that you're feeding. Yeah, you should be uh, reading the word every day. Sounds like you guys are talking about feeding the spirit, but it's flesh. 
absolutely. Crucifying the flesh when you feed the spirit. And it's a, it's an easy process. I know it can be intimidating, um, but it's an easy process. What you put in comes out. It's that simple. What do you, you need to put wear? in? What are we talking about? Your heart, your spirit. Feeding your spirit on Christ's truth is going to produce magnificent results mm -hmm. in your life. Mm -hmm. Magnificent results. What are you eating every day? And maybe it's just that we don't have time to do that. You know, like maybe work's too busy. Make the time. You got to make the time. You got to make the time. You make the time to watch TV, to have a dinner three times a day. You need to make the time to spend with the Lord to dive into the Word of God and to hear what He has to say. How are we to diversify His voice? We don't even know what it's all about. I think technology, the way things have gotten now, there's so many different ways that you can consume the Bible. We've got print, we've got text, we've got technology. And I'll tell you, technology is great. It makes it more accessible than ever. It's in the hands of people that may have never never had access to a Bible before. That's right. But at the same time, there are people out there that may have a problem with technology, may be easily distracted. You go and start reading your Bible, maybe someone texts you. You get out of your Bible, and uh, and you start texting them back. Or maybe it's, uh, it's an issue with watching YouTube videos or scrolling through Facebook, something like that. And I think it's important to realize... Uh, we can always go back, even in this technological age, to the print edition of the Bible. There's right. nothing like cracking that Bible open and holding it in your hands. Large print. That's why he said to um, go into the closet. Shut those distractions out. You know, when you pray, pray in, pray in the closet, man. I actually literally did that when I was first saved. I actually literally went into my bedroom closet and prayed. I took the word very literally when I was first. Mm -hmm. And I tell people all the time uh, I was just uh, naive enough to actually believe this book. So when did this happen? When did you just find your tithe? Um, my sister-in-law was murdered Amen. in Jacksonville. Wow. Really brutally murdered. Mm -hmm. My wife's sister, her older sister. She's abducted, oh. raped. How old was I? Yeah. I was uh, I was at a young age of 39. Wow. And my wife, um, they were, they were, they were like mothers to each other, sisters to each other, they best friends. They were everything to each other, and it really, it really destroyed my wife. Uh, she started drinking, and um, somebody came to me one day at the post office and uh, we were going to the trial of the guy they caught the guy that killed her but they hadn't found her and um, so somebody came to me we were going to the, to the arraignment to the arraignment not the trial the arraignment and somebody at the post office told me that if you ask uh, how did he put it if uh, if you ask uh, if you ask Jesus to help or something or along those lines you know and um, I was desperate, you know. I'd had, I'd had experiences with God on and off in my life, you know. But um, I was desperate, and so um, in the uh, in the courtroom, I, I asked him to uh, to help. And um, the guy, I can say his name. He's dead now. He died in prison. David Wyatt Jones. He uh, he he was glaring at me while I was praying this prayer. He was glaring at me, and um, and then all of a sudden he lowered his head, and and I said, "Wow, Jesus is working. Whatever you're doing, it's working." You know, I didn't know what I was doing, <laughs> and uh, are we all right? And um, uh, <laughs> I, I sorry. So so he lowered his head, and I said, "You know, whatever you're doing, it's it's working." And um, that night, late that night, like I said, they, he, he wouldn't admit that he killed her and he wouldn't tell them anything about, you know, and the family needed closure. It had been going on for weeks or, you know, she's not around and nobody can find her. And so uh, after that prayer in the courtroom, um, we got a phone call around midnight that night and uh, 
who was the sergeant in charge of the case, and I answered the phone, and he said, um, we found Laurie. And uh, he said, uh, he said Di David Wyatt Jones, who had taken him on a bunch of goose chases prior to this, just so he could get out of jail, have cigarettes, and you know, travel around outside for a little while. He took him on some wild goose chases. Mm -hmm. Said he'd take her, take him to the body. Um, but after this prayer in the courtroom, um, the sergeant called and said we found her body. David Wyatt Jones called and said he wanted to get right with God. And that he would take him to the body. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, he, he stayed in prison on death row right down the street from us here for uh, over 20 years. I really wanted to go visit him one time. really felt like the Lord wanted me to go visit him, and then I didn't do it. And then I found out he was dead when I really wanted to go to it. When I really got up the courage to go do it, I found out he had died. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, you know, he said he wanted to get his life right with God, so I can only assume that he did. You know, and it, it it made you know gave closure to uh, to my wife. Um, it didn't. It caused division in our family because they all wanted to hang him, mm -hmm. and um, we wanted to forgive him. Yeah, I call it filet mignon. Filet mignon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like that. But it is. It's the same thing. He right? ended up dead in the fire. Stole from his master. Yeah. Ran away, wronged him. Yeah. Paul wrote that letter and said, you treat your brother in Christ now. You treat him just like you would treat me. And he wronged him. He found, I will take that on like Christ took on the sin of this world. I will take that on. You forgive him and treat him like he's your brother. And uh, that's... He even told him, Theopolis, he told him, uh, you owe me your very life. Yes, he did. Yes, yep. yep. He called out the cards, man. He called it out. Called out yep. the marker, man. You know, I brought you to the Lord, son. Come on now. You got to forgive this boy. I had a dream. Laurie came to me in a dream and um, said that he was holding her soul. And I was going to go and um, confront him about it, ask him if there was any truth to any of this, because it was just a dream. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's a dream. I don't, I don't believe every dream I have. Powerful dream, man. Wow. But uh, yeah, I never got the chance. Of course, if he had her soul, <laughs> he had to let it go after he died, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that that was the uh, that was the reason that I wanted to go see him. I, the dream was just so so real and vivid that, yeah. um, you know, I, I don't, I'm, you know, I, maybe it's good that I didn't go because maybe it was just a dream. You know, maybe it was all. But I will tell you this. Um, during his trials, I worked uh, the evening shift at the post office. The trials, you know, they usually start in the morning time. And um, during the trials, uh there was one day during the, they were there every day of the trials in Jacksonville driving, you know, and there was one day I was just tired and I didn't feel like going. And um, my wife, she's probably one of the most understanding persons I know. And um, so she said, okay, and, and left. And um, her sister woke me up. Woke you up. Her voice. It was her voice anyway. Woke me up. You're not going? You're not going? Let me tell you something, guys. I jumped up, took a quick shower, and I was there. I was there before court started. My wife says, I thought you weren't coming. Shoot, your sister asked me, you're not going? Now, I don't know if it was her sister or not. I believe in things the Bible calls familiar spirits, mm -hmm. things that aren't from this world. And uh, just to educate everyone here, a familiar spirit is not something from this world. This is one of the fallen angels at work. They are assigned to lives. They study the life. 
They remember the darkest secrets that you have. And then when you lose a loved one, you may think that you are seeing a loved one as a ghost. You are not. You are seeing a familiar spirit, which is not your loved one. And we are also told not to communicate to the dead. So it does you no good to speak to that familiar spirit. But I just wanted to drop in here on the club to let you guys know. Fact check. It's ghost. an illusion. Yeah, that's yep. right. It's a vessel. It's an yeah. illusion. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Your, your loved one cannot communicate with you after they have left this earth. It's impossible. I, I, I 100% agree. Um, uh, not too long after all, all this murder and all, uh, my oldest son, he was a teenager at the time, I was cooking some uh, stir fry in the kitchen. And um, the way the trailer was set up, when you came in through the back door, you, it, the bathroom was straight across from the back door. And the kitchen was all the way at the other end of the trailer. And I was cooking the stir fry, and um, my son was here talking to me, looking down the hallway type, you know, looking at me, but he could see down the hallway. And um, uh, uh, something came in through the back door, had on white shirt and black pants, which is exactly what she was wearing when she was murdered a white shirt and black pants and it came through the back door and it went straight into the bathroom um, and that's exactly what her sister would do when she'd come and visit us she'd come in through the back door and she'd go straight to the bathroom because she drove from Jacksonville you know 40 minute drive or whatever and she had to go to the bathroom routine. so I followed it I followed it in there in that bathroom you could you could you could see your breath in the bathroom it was that much colder in the bathroom extremely cold in the bathroom. It's like being sleepy. It's like something out of Sixth Sense. The movie. That's the same. It's cold air. Yeah. It's the cold air. Yeah, it was real cold. Like you, could, you could blow your smoke. It was yeah. really cold. It was freaky. It was like a movie. Yeah. 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 She had a, uh, she had a pet rabbit, and her husband gave it to us. And uh, one night, the wife and I were engaged in uh, marital activity, and um, heavily engaged. And the dog was barking, and the dog was barking not like he barks when he's all mad and bad. He was barking like he was scared, and and it and it was and it was continuous and it wouldn't stop. So um, I I had to I had to tell the wife we got to stop. I got to see what's going on. There might yeah. be somebody out there. Yeah. And as soon as I touched the doorknob, he stopped barking. And um, might be going off the deep end here. And oh, and God. and uh, yeah. the next day I was I went to work, and my wife called me at work. And said, "You won't believe this. Um, Laurie's rabbit's head was pulled off in the backyard." Oh my! Yeah. Oh my gosh! Pet rabbit's head pulled off. In yeah, the it was backyard. decapitated. Yeah, and the head was on one end of the yard. When I got home from work, the head was at one end of the yard, and the, the body was at the other end. Before. Yeah, the dog stopped barking right when I touched the doorknob, though. That was the weird thing. Like something knew I was coming. Were you fearful during this time? How did you get through it when these things were happening to you? Well, when that happened, after that happened, I prayed for um, the Lord to station protecting angels all around my property. Yeah. And, um, and, and it worked. Um, uh, my brother-in-law, married to Lori, who was murdered, he, he said right in the Florida Times Union that there is no God. Uh, if there was a God... Uh, he wouldn't have allowed her to be killed. And um, we we would watch his daughter sometimes for him. He started getting a, he had a little bit of an alcoholic and stuff through it all. A lot of resentment. Yep. And he came up to the gate one day, and we were watching him through the through the window, and he, he got out of his car, went to open the gate, couldn't open the gate, he got back in the car. It was back and forth thing, back and forth thing. He couldn't get in. Hmm. Wow. I had to go out there and I had to go out there and – Bring the daughter to him. I had to bring his daughter to him. Wow. Something was preventing him from coming in. When these things were going on, this was something that caused there to be further communication between you and God. You went to God with these things as they were happening, as these phenomenons were happening. You were seeing these things. I feel like nowadays a lot of people, they don't turn to God. They don't try to handle these things and realize there's something that you can pray for, uh, something that you can speak to God about, and he can rectify the situation. They go outside, to outside sources. Uh, there's a, a huge increase in these ghost stories and 
a huge increase in people going and uh, talking with different people that do, uh, let's say, like uh, Reiki's in their house with sage and trying to purify the house and get rid of the spirits. But I love the fact that you went to the source of your existence to speak to him about these things. And it gave you the comfort. And it was able to take care of those things. Well, maybe not all of them. Yeah. <laughs> some things... Uh, some things that we want God to uh, get rid of is part of his will and plan. It's just too difficult for us to uh, see and deal with sometimes. Like what I just read. You know, w- what is man? I mean, how, how can he understand these things like I read there in that Dead Sea Scrolls? How, how can we, how can, you know, his ways are higher than our ways. How, how can we totally understand the ways of God? We can't. We can have the mind of Christ, Scripture says, but but. Unless we're continuously in the spirit, mm-hmm. we're we're gonna falter. This flesh, man. Mm-hmm. How do we stay continuous in the spirit? Well, Paul said, "Pray continuously without you know without ceasing." Paul said, "Pray without ceasing." Mm-hmm. Um, I've never been able to do that in my life. Pray without ceasing. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, too many distractions mm-hmm. um, in this world. You know, um, Corinthians calls, says, talks about the God of this world, blind and the unbelievers' minds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Satan is uh, hard at work. Yeah. And uh, he's a good reminder to tell you the truth, to know. Paul he's called him a worthy adversary. Yeah. Paul recognized. He's got power. Yeah. So I know you read from the uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and reading through those, and then looking at the state of the church now, especially within the modern day church, and, and, and a lot of the Christians now, do you see a difference in the relationship that they had directly after Christ was crucified with God? Do you see a difference between that relationship that they had first Christian? And the relationship today? And the relationship that you have today. Well, there, yeah, there's a lot of differences. I mean, first, the persecution. Yeah. Yeah. There's no persecution for Christians today unless you are truly speaking the word. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're really a Christian and you're speaking the truth, then you're going to catch the same flack Jesus said because he told you you would. Mm-hmm. He already said you ain't no greater than him. He said the, the, the student's no greater than the teacher. And he's the teacher, and so, of course, we're going to catch flack if we preach the truth. If you want to preach all this watered-down gospel and all this, as my friend the prophet Tim says, all this fall to raw, if you want to keep preaching all that, you know, and, and the guy who has the biggest tithe has the biggest mouth at the church, if that's how you want to be, well, you're, you're going completely against Scripture. See, God told me some 25 years ago that the way the church is to run is plain and simple. It's right in the book. When you gather together, let two or at the most three speak. Each has a hymn. We, we've, we've made it a one-man show. And that, that comes, if you do some studying in history, uh, in the church history, that comes from the Catholic Church. They had, they had too, many, too many churches built, and they didn't have enough pastors, so they started knocking it down to one per church. I forget what pope made that doctrine. But the but the uh, the uh, the Protestant Church didn't exist in those days, and they just followed suit. I'll tell you right now, no business, no organization, especially church, is not going to run well with one person at the table making decisions. Well, you 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 quench the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Um, you know, just like uh, just like this this thing here we're doing, this interview and all. If I was if I would have prepared for it, I I I I'd have been quenching him. Yeah. Uh, he he wouldn't he wouldn't be speaking. I'd be speaking. I mean, it's possible to tr- to ask him, maybe help you do some preparation ahead of time, which I've done for the last few days. I've preached in the bathtub for several days now, but um, I do that anyway, pretty much. That's right. Maybe a little more these last few days, but uh, for myself, baby. yeah, yeah. I've been out on that dock at the post office, and not one soul around. No truck drivers or nothing coming in to unload. And the Lord said, preach. And I just and he'd say preach, preach to the wind. 
It doesn't come back to me void. Just preach, son. Just preach. Maybe he just wanted to hear it. I don't know. But I just start preaching. I just stand out there and preach. And like I was saying when we were on break here a minute ago, I went to the post office from Wild Bill to the preacher man. Transformation. Why did that transformation take place in your life during that time? Jesus, man. Same reason I done what I've done. I used to drive past the homeless and um, and say, I won't use all the words I would say, but I would say, get a job, you bum. Been there, done that. Oh, yeah. So what drove that in you the last few years? Oh, it felt great, man. felt great every time I said it. I meant every word of it. Makes you feel better about your life when you say something like that. Sure, man, I'm above you, you bum. Yeah. Yeah. But then he came into my life, and a lot of those people down there could never understand. Um, I got into arguments even with people down there. They just couldn't understand that I wasn't doing this to give back. I wasn't doing this because I owed. I, I was doing this because he told me to. Jesus said obedience is greater than sacrifice. Painful, too. Yeah, man. I mean, I was down there during football season. <laughs> Sometimes I'd go down there on a Sunday. There's a church down there called the Church Without Walls, and it's for the homeless. And it's just like James said about, like I said, about putting the rich guy up front. You know, the homeless had to have church outside of the church. The only way that we got to go inside the building is if it was raining or it was real cold outside. Then we got to go into the building. But otherwise, we were outside. What does it say that speaks about that? It says that you give the unfortunate, the less fortunate, the first seat in the front. Mm-hmm. Not the last seat, not outside. I think it's important to also state that there's no requirement to help these people. No requirement. Too many people are often held back from service because they don't feel like they're clean enough to do it. Or somebody in that organization that's heading it up doesn't feel like they can be included because they're going to be a burden on the operation. They're not clean. They're not coming with a pure heart. And that holds us back. That holds us back tremendously. That's right. We'll always be dirty. Might as well get to work now. One of the best things you could do, especially if you're somebody that's out there that's struggling with maybe alcohol addiction or drug addiction, Get involved with helping people that have similar struggles as you. That's how it works. That's it. You're going to find your hope right there. That's how you recharge your battery. Mm -hmm. You give the juice that you have to someone that needs it more than you, and God will provide for you. Every time. There's no requirements. There's no resume. There's no specific experience that the creator of the earth is looking for. He's looking for your willing heart. Seek my kingdom and my righteousness first, and all these things will be added unto you. Why are you worried about what to eat and what to wear? Seek my kingdom and my righteousness first, and all these things will be added unto you. When uh, when, uh, I wanted my wife to quit working, and uh, stay home with the kids, And she gave me three reasons that she couldn't do it. And all three of those things were taken care of by the Lord within a few months. And I was paying child support to my first wife and uh, half my check. And uh, and then she quit. And people would come to me and they'd say, how are you doing it, man? How are you surviving, man? I mean, you don't have her whole check. Post office check's a good check, boys. And you don't have half your check. How are you doing it? I know what you're paying in child support. How are you doing it? I said, the Lord provides. And after so many times of people asking me, how do you do it? And I'd say, the Lord provides. And them just saying, yeah, right, and walking off. Finally, I said, I'm, st- I'm selling dope. I'm selling dope. <laughs> oh, really? I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew you were doing something, man. I knew it. There was no way, man. And I said, you know, the scripture says you'll believe a lie before you'll believe the truth. Boom. In their mind, you weren't allowed to be doing anything else. 
you had to be selling dope. I, I had to be doing something. There's no way the Lord's giving it to me, man. <laughs> yeah, there's no way he's doing that. Providing for you in a bountiful way. Yeah. Seek my kingdom and my righteousness first, and all these other things will be added unto you, man. That's the message, man. If you're out there struggling, out there on the street or something, man, seek him, man. And how do you seek him, you ask? <laughs> the word, man. And I guarantee you there's somebody down there handing out Bibles right now on the street. I guarantee you there's a church that will give you a Bible, man. And if you want, you know, I see, uh, I see this sign, uh, no peace, no God, no peace. No God, no peace. It's a fact. You're still going to struggle, but uh, I struggle. I struggle in a lot of things. I don't struggle in some of the ways uh, homeless struggle anymore. I'm not on the street, that's for sure. But, uh, man, if you seek him first, he'll give you all those other things. Now, he's not going to make you some millionaire if that's what you're wanting because that's, uh, that's not how he operates. He's going to give you what I like to say. He's going to give you your need, not your greed. He will provide, man. If you struggle with purpose, if that's the thing, once you read it, once you accept it, once he moves within you, you've got a purpose. Mm -hmm. And the struggle is worth it. Mm -hmm. It's worth every second of it. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to stop. The struggle is not going to stop just because... Uh, you know, I know a lot of times at the church they want you to think, you know, once you get baptized and accept Jesus, my life's going to be, you know, great. Well, tell that to the first disciples. They were all killed. Tell them how great it was. Now, if you're speaking the truth, you're going to catch hell on this earth. God is good, man. All the time. All the time. God is good. <laughs> I, don't know I love what, that saying. I don't know what you guys out there think about God, but you can look at your hands right now. You're looking at them. You can look at your friend. You're looking at them. You can look at the grass on the ground. You look at them. You can look in the sky. You see God. He is in every one of them. And if you're trying to figure out how can I talk to him, just like I'm talking right now, open up your mouth. Ask him a few questions. I guarantee you he will reveal himself to you. So ask the question. Open your mouth. Speak it out loud. And know that he will do it. Yeah. Because he said he would. There's a sticker out there that says, uh, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. It don't make a hoot whether you believe it or not. God said it, and that settles it. What he says is truth, and he's not an Indian giver. Nope. Once he gives it, that's it. He does not take back. Don't take nothing back, no, no matter how much you mess it up. Yeah. yeah. We're all, I mean, everybody that can hear me right now, I'm going to tell you. We're all like the, the old cartoon I liked to watch when I was a kid during Christmas. We're all the misfit toys on Misfit Island, man. All of us. Me, you, we're all misfit toys, man. And that's what he, uh, you know, I was thinking a couple of days ago, uh, Jesus never spoke to the people without a parable. He didn't even come here without a parable. He came here as a creator. He came here as a builder. He came here as a mender of broken things, a carpenter. What a parable. He even came in a parable. Yeah, he, uh, I used to tell a friend all the time, he's smart, and it used to aggravate my friend. He'd say, yeah, of course he's smart, he's God, but no, he's, he's really smart. He's really smart. His ways are higher than our ways, way higher. You're so right about the, uh, aspect of it I mean from Genesis all, all the way to, to Revelation it's nothing but creation and you've got parts of the Bible yes there's some destruction but why was there that destruction it was that God needed more room to create something bigger and better every time there was destruction he says behold I shall bring forth a new thing I shall make rivers in the desert and roads in the wilderness Yep, he allowed that temple to be destroyed to, to show them. I was, uh, like I said, I've been preaching lately a lot more than normal, maybe a little more than normal, and um, and today I was vacuuming the living room in preparation for you guys to come over. 
<laughs> and I was preaching. And what came out of my mouth was um, false worship has become a stench in my nostrils. It's like all this burning incense and, you know, when he talks about in the Old Testament, all these sacrifices and, you know, you ain't made no sacrifice, man. I, you know, people talk about, people talk about giving their money, you know. I'll, I'll give money. I'll give money. And he don't need your money, man. He needs you. And he doesn't even need you. He wants you. He doesn't need anything. He's God. But he wants you. He's like the mother who lets her three-year-old daughter help her make a cake. You know there's going to be some eggshell in the cake, man. You know that. But she lets her do it anyway because she wants her to feel like she's part of it. And that's what he's doing with us. He wants us to, we're all in the same boat together, man, all of us. It's taken me a long time to realize that. I've gone through a lot of phases in my walk with him. Uh, when I first got saved, I thought I was the last human being to save on the planet. I thought everybody knew Jesus. When I went around talking to people about I, uh, you know, how I found Jesus and all, they looked at me like I had three heads. And it surprised me because I thought everybody had already known him. I thought I was like the last one. I thought I was the worst person in the world. And I was the last one he'd save. God can save Tiger. He can save you, man. Yeah. yeah. And why? Why get saved? It's, for me, it's not, it's not, just about eternity it's about now uh you know you're out there worried about <laughs> well some of y'all are out there worried about just survival but now you got this coronavirus and people are freaking out i mean my wife just went to bj's and, and when dixie and the and the shelves are empty mass hysteria people are freaking out they they and why because you're afraid to die. I think ultimately people are afraid to die because they have no idea where they're headed. Well, that'd be 100% correct. Good thing I know where I'm headed. Ultimately, I invited Jesus into my heart at a very young age. I'd like to say I found him, but I know that he found me. And because he did find me, and I did accept him into my heart, I know. If you know the story of Christ, when he died on the cross, well, there was a thief to his left and there was a thief to his right. And the man on his left he was not a believer that Jesus was the King, the Son of God, the one that was sent here to die on the cross for our sins. But the man on his right said, I believe you. And Jesus responded and said, Today you will be with me in paradise. So I have a peace and heart everywhere I go. It wouldn't matter if I died right now. Probably send me back and say, you know what? You got plenty to do. Go back to work. That's what he told me. I'm not finished with you yet. Not that I wasn't finished. He wasn't finished. 